This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, first of all, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I'm sure it takes a tremendous and serious nefesh to come here. If you weren't here, you would be home behind some refrigerator, someplace scrubbing, and behind an oven. And, and you gave that all up to come here and hear a shir. It's just quite a serious nefesh on your part. I know you tell your wife, I'd love to stay here and help, but I have to go. I was wondering why there's a bigger island tonight than usual. But anyway, uh, I guess, Shkoyach Yosef, mitzvah gerer is mitzvah. So as soon as the cleaning starts, there's this cheshik to go to Shirim. Um, honestly, there's a certain stress level that people experience, as we have been discussing over the last couple of weeks, during this time of the year. Um, and that stress is tailor-made, as we also have been discussing, as to who we are. They say there was this person who came from a little town. It's the first time you ever saw a teapot, a chinik. And uh, it made him very nervous. He didn't know what that was. He walks outside, and a big surprise is coming. Then a big locomotive comes coming his way. He's never seen anything like this in his life. And he's standing on the tracks, and it's barreling toward him. And somebody screams, he yells, he yanks him out the last second. He says, you almost got killed. And he walks back in, looks back at the teapot, makes the connection, takes the teapot, throws it out the window, runs out with his axe, smashes it to smithereens. I said, what did you do to the teapot? He says, you know when that gets big, you know how dangerous it is? You realize what it is? The end says that we're all human beings, and the truth is that the teapot creates a tremendous amount of pressure. When the pressure is channeled the right way, you have hot coffee. And when you have a real a lot of tremendous amount of pressure channeled the right way, you have a locomotive that can pull a huge freight uh, car. So, we would love to wave a magic wand to make all the pressure disappear as Yom Tov comes up and everyone has their Nisiyanis, whether it's before Yom Tov or uh, after Yom Tov, and there are many. Somebody said to me, what does the couple of days before Pesach and the top-notch attorney have in common? It's a couple of days before Pesach and a top-notch attorney. So I was thinking along the lines, oh, it's like a, it's a Seneger, all the, the Malachim that are created through preparing for Pesach and the Moaz Chitim. He says, no, I wasn't thinking along those levels. I was thinking on a much simpler level. I said, I give up. What is the, what is the last couple of days before Pesach and a top-notch attorney have in common? He says, they both cost $300 an hour, he says to me. <laughs> so Rabbi Yisrael Salanter... Uh, when they asked him what chumrah they can adapt for the matzahs, so he said, my father used to share this with me, that, you know, one of those 17-minute matzahs, we have the 16-minute matzah, we have the brisket matzahs, only one matzah per year that we put into the oven, everyone else has to line up, I'm just joking, uh, you know, whatever it is, all various different chumras, Arizona wheat, this wheat, Hawaii wheat, uh, all the 50 states, you have wheats, you know, whatever, everyone has their chumras, what they have, uh, when it comes to matzahs. So they asked Rabbi Yisrael Salante, what chumrah would you want? He says, I want to make sure that throughout the entire process, the many almonis and yisoyimim, the widows and the orphans that tend to work in the matzah bakery, which is a part-time work and available, that you don't yell at them and you don't scream at them. That's the chumrah that I want in my matzahs. Uh, in other words, Rabbi Yisrael Salante didn't play with words. And what he really meant was, yes, there is a pressure to scream, there is a pressure to yell. The matzahs have to get out on time and orders have to be met. And, there's a, and you have Almanis and Yisoyimim working. And when you hold yourself back from screaming at them despite your pressure, that is a chumrah in the matzahs. That enhances the kedusha of the matzah as well as halachis uh, enhance the uh, kedusha of the matzah in their own way. I think we say this story once a year as well, that the briskarov had tremendous chumras with the matzahs, and the godal year shemayim shaloi. But he was also mocked that no one should be hurt. And somebody once came to me and said, I was taking this wheat from, from one place to the other on the train, and I knew that if I fell asleep in the middle, you wouldn't consider it shmira. He says, and I, I, I tied a string, the string of the package, uh, around my finger so tight that it would not allow me to fall asleep. And he even showed the brisk that he still had the black and blue mark from where the string was. He said, I won't use it. He said, I won't use wheat that someone, you know, someone infl- inflicted a wound upon themselves uh, on the basis of uh, making it. So tzaddikim are very sensitive to this. So somebody once told the Briskarov a story, out of all people, told the Briskarov a story that 
There was a Chassidus Rebbe that had tremendous chumras with matzahs. They started cutting the matzahs after Chanukah. Unbelievable chumras. Hundreds of people employed. Rechaim Shalyad, the greatest madrega of Lashma and Shmira, every possible chumra in the world. And the Rebbe had these matzahs. And as he was walking by, he saw a simple yid baking simple matzahs. And the yid said, Hashem, please help me. Help me, my matzahs shouldn't be chumras. He said, you know what? You take matzahs, I'll take yours. So he told the briskara of the story. So the briskara said, and look what happened. The simple yid's tefillah was fulfilled. He taka got the kosher matzahs. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know which story you're saying to whom. But the anis, the, the, the pressure that goes into yamtiv and the preparing of yamtiv and the mysterious nefesh that we have to avoid conflict and not to hurt others, even though some are feeling the cleaning pain and some are feeling the, 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 you know, the financial pain, whatever it is, that is not just a, a saying, it's a chumra in the matzah, and it helps us achieve what the yamtif is supposed to do for us. It's, it's a very controlling kind of a yamtif. It's very easy for the woman of the house to be controlling, and like uh, we heard before, someone said that, uh, you know, the uh, Ravan Garish spoke here and said that uh, you have to remember children are not Chametz, uh, when they say dust is not chametz, and uh, children are not the carbon pesach, and then it's very hard, it's very easy for the man to be controlling. You know, when it comes to money, he's unreasonable and doesn't understand it. it, it, it what happens is the wife doesn't understand the pressure of the husband, and the husband doesn't understand the pressure of the wife, and sometimes both don't understand the pressure of the children, and the children don't understand the pressure of the parents. And what pesach is all about is each one appreciating the other person's pressure and focusing on not what I have to get accomplished, but how can I make things easier for my spouse, whether it's for my wife, whether it's for my husband, whether it's for my child, whether it's for my father, whether it's for my mother. You know, what does it mean? Uh, a single spouse, the first pesach, that someone is a single spouse. Doesn't have a spouse, I mean. You know, the ain't ish mesel labayla, the the pain, the sensitivity to that pain, and so on. So but to be able to sit back and say, my focus is on making someone else happy. That is my tafkir in yamtif. Someone told me this story, which I guarantee you is not true, but it's a great story anyway. That when uh, Senator Lieberman, you know, he ran for vice president, and when he lost, uh, as a human being, he took it very hard, and he came home. And he told his wife, I lost. His wife said, don't worry, she was Menachemim, she understood him. She said, I promise you, never mind America, in this house you will always be the vice president. Do you understand? <laughs> You'll always be the number two man. You know, our role isn't to try to attain power or control or have it our way. Our role is to be in the number two position to support the number one. That's really what it's all about. So you all know that there is something, there was a company, is a company, but right? Thank you, Yosef. A company called Dell Computers, which used to make computers, but now they don't make computers. What do they do now? They make software for computers, right? Am I right, Yosef? Sure? No? No, it's not true? That's what I read someplace. They, IBM? IBM? I read someplace, Dell. I don't know. Okay. Machloikas. Well, either way, the marshal is uh, going to be the same. Okay? So this, this, the CEO of this company said, we used to make computers, now we, we just make software for computers. He says, basically, we either IBM or Dell. We have Machloikas here between Yosef and Yeshua. Um, Lamaisa, the point is that until now we made computers. Now our job is we don't make the computer. We tell somebody else, what do you want your computer to do? And we'll try to get it to work. Okay? It's like in Ahmadiyya, they had this thing with this little, uh, little boy showing this book to a parent and says, what's this, man? I never saw anything like this. He says, oh, that was the old-fashioned way, the old-fashioned software, how they would install the information in the brain. That was like uh, an old thing, right? So, and basically the CEO of this company, one of the two, Dell or IBM, he gave this whole schmooze that someone showed me. And he said that if you make a new product, you never know when that product is going to be obsolete. That's BlackBerry, right? Uh, you never know when it's yet. There's regular air conditioners. Now uh, they're, they're making an air conditioner that also swaps mosquitoes. That's what they said. Make another air conditioner you can control from your phone or your smartphone. You can get them on, get them off, you know, you can do whatever you want. Let's say you're far away in Florida or something and you see a Ghanif coming into your house, you know what I mean? And he turns on the air conditioner. You could turn it off. I'm not sure what you could do with it exactly, but something along those lines. It's very, I don't, I'm not sure exactly why you'd want to control your air conditioner from your phone, but I'll go upon him. In any event, you know. This guy, has, you know, this guy has a fight with his uh, spouse at home and says, what, that's what you did? I'm turning the air conditioner off. What? Turn that air conditioner back on, you know? 
she has one thirds of the air in his office. You know, then it goes right. Uh, then you have a phone thirds of the guy's car in the middle of driving. Would you dare say that to me? Ah, I'll be right. Imagine people walking around with phones, turning everything off. Right, air conditioning is cars, elevators going the wrong direction. What? Right? That's what you said. Brr, you know, stops. Why is the elevator going down? You said the wrong thing. Your wife is on the phone. Your husband's on the phone. You know, this is dangerous business here. Okay, so projects become obsolete. I, I God that did this. I was walking by, you know the shuls, the big shuls uh, in Flatbush and Barapak, the minion with what's called factories, balas. So they have people outside selling things, right, on tables. So I remember years ago what they used to sell. They would sell ties, belts, socks, umbrellas, cheap cufflinks, uh, batteries, watches uh, on chains, uh, shoelaces, uh, keychains, Kamoi Parker pens, things that are similar to Parker pens, you know, mouse traps, uh, cassette tapes. Um, Cheap tape recorders, little spiral pads, you know, shoe polish, mice traps, calendars. That's what they used to sell. And as a grad, I passed these stores today. What are they selling today? They're still selling ties, belts, socks, umbrellas. Cheap cufflinks are still selling. Uh, and, but, but things changed. You know, they're selling holders for smartphones. Uh, you know, holders for GPSs, uh, Bluetooth. Uh, instead of the mouse trap, they're selling wireless mouses. It's, it's, it's different. So imagine someone from... You know, 10 years ago, you know, like we're looking back at what they sold 10 years ago, we're laughing. This one guy place I passed, he was selling uh, circus decorations. But I noticed he didn't have any calendars, so that probably would explain it. Let's test well. So, you know, we're laughing at the previous generation. You really, the next generation is going to laugh at us. Okay, so here we come to the point of what I would like to say. You know, some banks, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, but banks, they have this big mu- uh, picture of his, like historical, what, like what the street looked like 100 years ago. Ever saw some banks have that? So I passed by this bank on 13th Avenue. They have this big picture of that street in Bar Park 100 years ago. Right? Mamish 100 years ago. It says circa 1914. Anyone know what circa means? I asked a bunch of people. It's what you put on an old picture, right? Okay. So something like that. So there's a picture of the very corner where the bank is. And, uh, you know, on the side it says that some of these buildings are actually still standing. So I'm looking at the picture. It's a big picture. And what do you see on the picture? So you see uh, cigar stores, tobacco stores, the old candy stores, uh, stores selling newspapers. Um, uh, You see uh, barbers with those poles, remember, with the round red things that go around and around. Um, And there's a store selling ice, right? And, 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 And crossing the street is this family. You're like a father and a mother, you know, Baruch Hashem still dressed near stick in 1914. Uh, I took my kids once, and there's a subway museum. So they have, like, these old trains to the new trains. So I had this shtick. Uh, uh, we went on each car. I would tell them a story about a train. Took all my kids in 8 o'clock. So we went. Like, so we got till the 60s. Then the advertisements started changing. By the 70s, we had to turn around and go back to the 30s. You know what I mean? But that you could do on a train. You know, it's hard to do it on life. So I- I'm looking at this picture, and I'm thinking to myself... You know, this father and this mother and this little girl, you know, dancing, skipping ahead. It was a real picture, crossing the street. The buildings are still here, but, you know, the cigar stores aren't there. The home furnishings aren't there. The candy store is not there. Definitely the ice store melted into a cell phone store. And the chances are... (coughs) Not that nothing worse than a half a sneeze, you know? Either you sneeze or like... You know what I mean? The chances are that... You know, not that father, not that mother, and not that little girl. If that little girl was six years old, she would have to be 106 years old. So the probabilities are that she's already in the Isle of Miamis. So I'm looking at this picture, and I'm saying it's so sad. There must be a way that you could look at this picture, and you can say in 100 years from now, it still lives. It's still going to go. So if someone took a picture of us in 100 years from now, he's also going to say, oh, right? I mean, imagine your picture, your picture, my picture, right? Can you, can you imagine yourself? on top of some dresser, you know, and a kid comes in. Who's that? That was your great-grandfather. They dressed funny in those days. Whoa. Right? How, you know, and, and then you're like, just a picture. So There must be something that you can do to imbue into life that you're not just a picture. Okay? Lakewood, Yeshiva Lakewood started as one building. There's a whole story how they got that building, and they had a grand total of 14 Talmidim. Which is, which is how Klesk started. Some of those 14 Talmidim were, Shraga Fivelim and the Lovitz sent the, his best Talmidim to Rabbi Aaron to help him open liquid. So liquid was struggling for Bachrim, can you imagine? 
and uh, they were sent there. And you have Rabbi Kato Zechot Sadik Levracha, who's uh, pressing the restart button for Tyra after the war in a country that Rabbi Chaim Belazhner called the Let's Distancia, the last station before Mashiach, which is America. And everyone tells him it's impossible. Everyone tells him it's not going to happen. But that was the last thing that would discourage him. And he's struggling to keep to pay for this yeshiva. And the neighbors say, we're going to run this yeshiva out of town. No way. What's the yeshiva doing in Lakewood? Okay, try to imagine that. Right? One little building. No air conditioning. And they couldn't close the windows. So they opened the windows. The neighbors started screaming. They didn't like the 14 kids making a racket when they were learning. Try to picture this. Okay, We're not talking about that long ago, relatively speaking. And Rabbi Aaron would have to travel to Brooklyn sometimes two or three times a week to raise money for this yeshiva. And the, the other in Yonam and Klal Yisrael that he was my son Nefesh himself for Chinuch Hatzmoi and the Godus Yisrael and the, the situation of Tyre and and everything else that was going along, the Giyas Bonus thing, everything that was going in those days. With, but they risked their lives, the G'daylam of that time, which is the reason we're still around over here. So Rabbi Aaron is on the way back. And in those days, how long did it take from Lakewood to Brooklyn? It took a minimum of three hours. And the reason is not because I was driving with my car, no. Even my car was like only a year into its creation by then, no. The, the reason it took so long, anyone? There was no Arizona Bridge. You know, a lot of people think the Arizona Bridge is one of the seven wonders of creation. It is not. It was constructed in 1959. The upper level opened in 1964 which I'm sure if you tried to take the lower level before, right afterwards you were in trouble because it didn't exist yet. The lower level only started in 1969. It was supposed to be for trains, and then they changed their mind for whatever reason. Okay? So try to think about this. So it took three, the only way to get from Lakewood to New York was you had to go into Manhattan and come, come back down. You have to cross the Howland and the Lincoln Tunnel. Right? I don't know when the uh, Howland Tunnel was made. I don't know. Never figured it out anyway. The Brooklyn Battery Tunnel goes to Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Bridge goes to Brooklyn. The Manhattan Bridge goes to Manhattan. Queensboro Bridge goes to Queens. Where does the Howland Tunnel go to? New Jersey. I don't know. Okay. A lot of caches in this world. All right. In any event, but you'd have to go through the Howland Tunnel to come back down. And then you, know, you had the traffic. It took three hours. Which is one of the reasons that Aaron wanted in Lakewood. He wanted the place at least three hours away. Okay. You have to, there was no Howland Tunnel yet? took the bus to the Lincoln Tunnel. Took the bus to the Lincoln You can imagine what it was like. Bus station, right. So he went there, but now he had a driver coming back, and they just installed a new thing by the tolls, right? Forget about Easy Pass. Easy Pass was still science fiction. But uh, they had this basket where you would throw in automatic change, you know, and then you would go, and you would go right through. So this guy, he knows Rosh Hashiva has to get home to go to sleep as early as possible, and he's coming back, and Rosh Hashiva like, wakes up, he sees him veering to the side, he hops right in what's happening, he says, no, 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 go to the man. Go to the human being. He says, you know, there's like, why? It goes faster. Rashiv has to get home. He says, how would you feel if you were a human being standing there and they just created this basket that does your job? And a car comes by and there's no, no and, you, and you just go to the basket instead of him? Well, where's the covered abris? Where do you do that? Okay? Now, what does that mean? That's an uptight in life. That's not just a story. That meant that Rabbi Aaron understood that you are number one when you put yourself in a... When you, he understood his tafkit in life is, wherever I am, my achrayas is to put you on track or to do my best for you. That's, it's a very different way of thinking. Contrast that with this story, which I will call a mashal. Okay? Because I hope it never happened. But, you know, there are certain stores before Pesach, hardware stores, shoe stores... Uh, you know, some of the food stores, I mean, if you saw, I saw a food store from a grocery, it said emergency vehicle with lights on top, you know, uh, with the name of a grocery on it, delivering uh, things. Uh, this time of the year, things get pretty hectic. But one of the places where it's organized chaos or bedlam or pandemonium is a hat store. Have you ever been in a hat store right before Pesach? You know, Ben Ismanum, when everyone is home, you know what goes on in a hat store. You have uh, a bunch of people standing around, everyone's screaming, literally screaming, and trying to get the attention of the poor workers who are working from morning to night, trying to... And you have these questions coming from all sides. Is the brim too wide? Is the brim too narrow? Is the crown too high? Is it too low? Are the pinches too deep? You know, here, is this my... You, this I really heard once. The guy says, okay, what's your hat size? My hat size? I know, seven and two-eighths right after a haircut. Eight and two-eighths in between haircuts. Size nine when I'm overdue for a haircut. Okay. When is your next haircut? You know what I mean? Right? 
This guy comes into a hat store and says, can you please make sure that the back of my hat is even? He says, why the back of your hat? He says, because my friends talk about me only after I pass. You know, they don't mind the front of my hat, right? So you have this whole choir of voices that continues to try to attract the notice of the tired employees running around to try to give all of Bena's man, all the Bachram, coming back from the mirror, hats, you know? Excuse me, I'm next, excuse me, I'm next. This guy comes in, excuse me, excuse me, no, I'm next, excuse me, excuse me, I'm double parked in front of a hunking uh, city bus that's trying to get away. Can, can you please service me first because, you know, like everyone's like screaming over there, you know what I mean? Like, uh... Hello, hello, what's the problem? There's a problem with my hat, what? I told you my initials are OHD, not OCD. Can you please take it out? Right? What kind of hat do you want? Do you want a Bieber hit? you, you want a bent up, bent down, a Hamburg, a Gestoff in a hit like that, you know, the, the flat? I don't know, which one do you recommend? Like, it doesn't work that way, which one do you recommend? Who are you? You don't got to know who you are. You know? Excuse me, is this good quality? Is it waterproof? Yes, it's waterproof. Dunk it in, you know, you're a toivel at every Friday together with the matzo. You know, well, 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 you know what I mean? Is, is this the type of hat that'll fly off in the wind? Because my last hat flew off in the wind. No, this hat? No. We'll get you one of those straps you'll put around your, like, uh... You know, like the state troopers wear. We'll, uh... So in the midst of all this chaos and pandemonium, okay, this uh, particular father comes in, with, looks like with his son, to buy a bar mitzvah hat. He doesn't just come himself. He comes with a whole Sanhedrin Hagadol. comes in. They're all going to judge the thing, right? Now I want to tell you, they must have sent that worker up and down the stairs dozens of times until he fitted the right hat on the boy. And uh, when they finally got the right hat, so one of the on-site consultants said... Okay, now that we know exactly what we're looking for, let's check out the prices in some other stores. Okay, that's what he said. So by the way, you know that if you don't, if you ask someone how much something is, or you don't intend to buy something, that is a Noah's Dwarim. I don't know if they, uh, no, uh, no, it's not a Noah's Dwarim, it's Le I, I, I don't know if they, it's, it's Lav of Now, I don't know if they could be, doesn't apply every, because we think they, if the price was maybe the... Maybe they plan on coming back to buy it. But whatever the case, you've got to be careful. But this, 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 this floored me. I'm sorry, it's just a muscle. i am just floored me. Okay. The, the, the child shrugged, and he felt somewhat guilty that this poor guy's going up and down. And he says, okay, now that we know what it fits like, we're going to another store to check the price. He's like, okay. So the kid says, the kid thanks him and apologizes. You know, it's his bar mitzvah. And one of the, quote, adults end quote, that came along with this whole Chad Gadia with this kid, to buy his hat, says to the kid, what do you have to apologize to him? What do you have to thank him for? It's his job. I want, I, I want to contrast that story with Rabbi Aaron, right? Uh, saying, no, let's go to the man, because there's a human being standing over here. Now, do you understand what Rabbi Sol Salanter is saying, that the Chumrah and the Masses was not to scream at the Almonis? Do you understand that you're defining yourself who you are, that when the Baba Verov, Rav Shloim of Baba Zerchut Sali Levracha sent his son to buy, you know, his Bekisha. So there was a Bekisha store that opened up. That's the silk robe that see them wear, which is now not real silk or whatever it is, or what it was made then. And the guy was learning how to do it, and it came back rather imperfect. So his son said to his father, I mean, no, look at it here, look at it there. And the Rebbe said, What hither mitzvah, how beautiful. He says, a mitzvah in the Torah of a Hechazak to buy. The mitzvah of a Hechazak to buy is to support someone, and even if he's struggling in his business. So he pointed to all the flaws in the Bekesha, and uh, the Rebbe said, what a beautiful Vechazak the boy. And every time he pointed to a rip or, an, or, or, or the buttonhole didn't match up with the button, he said, what a beautiful Vechazak the boy. Wow. What hither mitzvah. Well, I've never seen such a nice Bekesha. It all depends what you're looking for in a Bekesha. Now, if you're going to talk about Rabbi Aaron's Mesiris Nefesh for others, it's not limited to a toll booth. You understand that. If you understand the war stories that Revarin uh, went through, if you understand that uh, when he was with his yeshiva with Kletz, when they were running away, when he went through under the Russians in Messias Nevis Retorio, when his father in law, Rabbi Suzam and Nelson, sent him certificates to be able to escape and go to Palestine, and he wrote him the telegrams, and we have them, they're printed. He said, uh, You're sitting on a volcano that's about to erupt, you know, with Russia and Germany. Get out! And he said, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving until, until uh, he figured out a way that, his, that there was a viable escape plan for his Talmidim. But to leave them here to get killed and me going, oh no. And those, those certificates, if you would understand the value of those certificates, it was a key to life. He let them expire. He didn't go. Tried to give them away to someone else. Didn't work the transfer. He, they expired. 
because he would not leave until he was convinced that, that if he stays, he's going to be arrested by the Russians, and, and there was a plan with Japan, and there was everything else, and, and if he comes to America, he'll be able to help from this side even more. So with all those Cheshbanis, he reluctantly left. And he came to America, came off the boat, there was a huge dignitary uh, celebration, Rabbonim, Chosh of people, a Kabbalah, Spanim. He raced right through it. He says, I don't have time for this. We've got to save people. You cut it out? And he said, I didn't come here for myself. I came here to help others. And that started uh, several years of 24-7, the serious nefesh of Hatzalah, in, in an unbelievable way. Okay? So now, here's my point, and please understand what I'm trying to say. I hope this makes sense. When I am walking by this picture from 100 years ago, and you see this nice little family crossing the street between the cigar stores. So I know the cigar store is not there anymore. I know the ice store is not there anymore. And I know those people aren't alive. Where are they? It all depends how they reacted. In other words, it, when this... I don't know who those parents saw and who that little girl is when they walked into a store. But if they walked in and they said to the man working in the cigar store, mixing the tobacco, oh, how's your mother doing? Or they walked into the furnishing store and this guy schlepping a heavy mahogany table and they ran over and said, can I help you? And if on their way out, they went to the ice guy and said, so tell me what's doing, how's business, how can we help you, how's your cousin, how's your wife? And there was a chit-chat back and forth. I said, come on, we'll wait a few minutes, we'll give you a ride home. Then that picture is still alive. Then trust me, that kid is driving in Murray Park, and we'll do the impossible, the unthinkable. Somebody is parking. And he'll stop and wait for him to back into the parking space, as opposed to swinging around him or crushing him as they look half turning in. And he comes, whoop, you know, like the Hamazel you have an out here. He'll actually wait two minutes for someone to park in front of him. So, in a sense, those pictures are alive. Now, let's try to understand this. The cigars are gone. The clothes they were selling in those stores in 1914 are gone. The 1914 headlines are totally not Nogaya. It means absolutely nothing. In those days, the prehistoric, they couldn't even find the plane that fell into an ocean in those days. It was gone. The, the emphasis is not a joke. The people are in siren and pain. And, you know. but, but, it, but it just shows us how, you know, the Bunishan doesn't want us to find something. We just don't find it. Nothing there is Nogaya. The buildings are standing. But ultimately, what was important when that family went out that day to buy a piece of furniture? Was it to treat the people, to teach a child to treat a person like a mensch? Or was it the piece of furniture? The piece of furniture is gone. But if they taught that people to treat a child like a mensch, that lasts forever. And I think that that's one of the inyonim of the Seder night. The Seder means to be misader priorities. Be misader the priorities in your life. So we have Kaddish before Urchatz. It's not supposed to work that way. First Urchatz, then Kaddish. First you wash yourself, then comes the Kedusha. Sur me ravi Not the Seder night. There's a certain Mahalach that we have in life which makes sense to us. But as we meet different people, and as we encounter situations in life, we say, wait a second, if I continue here, I'm going to hurt this person. And we stop and we rearrange our priorities, even though that's not the reason that I left. Then the world begins to change around us. So the Maharal says, a very deep vart, that from Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim until Mashiach, the Rabbi Hashem has a cheshmer for every single generation. The Rabbi Hashem knows how many years, but ultimately, the Rabbi Hashem knows how many generations there are from Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim until Mashiach. And something has to be accomplished in order for Mashiach to come. And if the sixth generation to Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim didn't do it, then the Rabbi Hashem pins his hopes on the seventh one, and on the eighth one, and on the tenth, and on the twentieth, and on the thirtieth. Now, the, the, the externals change. Here they're selling batteries and, and uh, spiral notebooks, and there they're selling Bluetooths, and in ten years from now, they which is a lot beaten what they're going to be selling. But the Nisiyanis, human nature doesn't change. And what we have to understand is that the point of Pesach isn't whether my wife doesn't understand me or I don't understand her, or the, why are you doing this? You know, you deal with a Shalom bias issue. You say, well, they, they say to this guy, why are you making such a petty thing about such nonsense of what your wife said? Because when I said it, she made an issue. And now I have to make an issue back. Uh-huh. And you'll be left with one big issue. And like you said, the kids are going to be the Kurbanis. What, what, what is your priority? Is your priority, this is nonsense, none of this. Neither you or your wife are going to be on this world in a hundred years from now. But the mysterious nefesh that you had is going to, is going to 
accomplish what it has to in terms of bringing the gola is going to set your children on a mahalach where you are accomplishing your purpose. And therefore, says the maral, that's the meaning of b'chol dar v'dar, chayav adam liris es atzmai kiliyatsam yimitzrayim. You have to look at the atzmias of who you are. You have to look at the metzias of why am I here. Forget the externals. Of course I sit down and I'm trying to figure out how to make a living. And how I'm going to pay my schal limit. And how I'm going to pay the rent and so on. But the metzias is as life goes into motion, the reality of what is going to take place is the human factor. Everything else is irrelevant, like props in a play. We mentioned often the fathers of used to share this with me. The, the Chayz of Lublin used to call in his Talmudim the first 12 days of Nisan. On the first day, he told them whatever's going to be happening throughout the month of Nisan. On the second day of Nisan, he told them what's going to be happening on the month of Ir, on the third day, and so on. And the Rebbe Rebunim was told once, I know you manage a woods and, and, and the, the lumber over there, and you know it's going to go belly up, it's going to bankrupt. And the Lamai said, what happened was, they used to put the water, the logs onto the ice and slide it down the river. Then it would get chopped up in the mill. Some of there was a change in the weather. It either was too icy or it wasn't icy, and they couldn't get the logs down. And the competitor got there ahead of them, and they were in trouble, and everybody was losing their panos. And the Rebbe Rabunim burst into tears. He said, Rabbi Nishalaylam, I know this is on the map, but come on, please, these people need panasa. And then he had a thought. He says, that Yosef Atzadik worked for Patifar? And Patifar was Matzliach in the Schus of Yosef. He says, I'm not Yosef, but my boss is not Patifar, so can't we even this out a little bit over here? And all of a sudden it froze up or it melted, or whatever had to happen, happened, and boom, the logs got there. So the only kasha was, but the Rebbe told him that uh, it's going to go bankrupt, and it didn't go bankrupt. So he came back to the Rebbe, he said, should I ask him the question or not? So he walked into the Chayzer, the Chayzer looked at him, and the first thing the Chayzer said was, ah, I didn't mean tears. But today, my tears changes everything. You were crying. You, you, you cry like that. that, that, that that's a different question. Uh, one good omen, Yehesh Meirava, changes 70 years of Xeris. So let's try to understand this a little bit, okay? The Kedusha Slavi said, twice a year we go to water. Tashlach, we go to throw in our Averis. Pe- Pesach, we go Mayim Shalon, and we pull it back up. There's a difference between uh, Rosh Hashanah, we don't eat nuts. Why? Because nuts is gematria chet. It has the numerical value of the word sin. Says the Katzke Rebbe, we're scared of the numerical value of sin, we're scared of sin, but anyway. So we don't eat nuts. On Pesach, it says, you dafka give out to the children nuts. Why? It says the Bardichava, that Tishrei is tshuva meyira, tshuva out of fear. Tshuva out of fear brings down the level from mezit to shaygib. You still don't want the avera. Tshuva meyahava, tshuva out of love, Meaning to say, I'm just embarrassed to do this. I'm here for a reason. I understand that, which is a level of tshuva me'ahava, not so much my fear of punishment. That turns the Aveira into a mitzvah. So on um, Tishrei, where it's tshuva me'ira, we're throwing away the Aveiras. On um, Nisan, we say, wait a second, let me draw the Aveiras. Let, let, let me bring it back. Now what does that mean, draw the Aveiras? I'm looking for Aveiras, that's not what he means. Right, the Baditsha once met someone, a big ball of Averis. He said, I'm a kind of you, I'm jealous, you do tshuva, all your Averis turn into mitzvahs. He said, Rebbe, next year you'll be even more jealous of me, he said. <laughs> <laughs> he told him, you come back, by Yavolet Siengayel, Shavit Vashabiyaka, and he stood there and he did tshuva. Now, again, I want to try to explain this a little bit more. I saw a story in the Agada, the Stipler Agada, this says an amazing story. It says there was a man before Pesach, he was a Meshulach for a certain Kailu, and he used to come to America to collect money. Come back right before Pesach. And his wife told him, listen, that you're leaving, that's okay. You have to make... But the kids, there's no yeshiva, it's Ben Isman, kids are running around. Where's your Christ to the children? Running around the streets, you can't do this. You cannot leave, you cannot leave this year, you cannot leave this year. So he went to the stipler, the stipler said, what should I do? I have to close the coil. So the stipler said to him, are you making any money? He said, no, I don't take a commission. He said, don't? So this is what it says in the Haggadah of the Stipler. Whatever, I'm not saying anything on mice. But the Stipler told him, 12% you're allowed to take. Yeah, 12% you should take. Okay? And tell your wife, from now on, it's going to be a chilek of your panas. So he comes back a week later. He says, is your wife still saying, don't go, don't go? No, now she's saying, when are you going? When are you leaving already? When are you leaving already? Right? I don't mean wife, husband. The husband can do it to the wife also. Our priorities are rearranged based on what we feel is negaya to our mitzvahs. Now, Tishrei, there's a machloikis in Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua when the world was created. Rabbi Eliezer says, B'Tishrei, Nivra Ha'olam, the world was created Tishrei. And Rabbi Yeshua says, B'Nisa, Nivra Ha'olam, the world was created Nisa. So you see, the B'nai Yisachar talks about it, he brings some the Arizal, really they don't argue. Tishrei was created B'Maisa, Nisan was B'Machshava. What does it mean, Nisan was B'Machshava? What does that mean? 
They just said, but for us, I'm in the planning stages to the building stages, a couple of, you know, could be time. But what, what does that have to do with, uh, by the Banish time, it's one, two, three, it's time of ice, so there's no, why, why, why are there six months between the planning? The Metzius is a different kind of a Metzius. The, the Metzius of Tishrei is, we recreate ourselves. We, we're different people on Tishrei. The Metzius of Nisan is no, you are who you are. But your attitude, your machshava changes. Your lave toward who you are changes. The Hashem, this is who I am. This is my family. These are my nesiyainess. This is my temper. This is my fear. These are my anxieties. Help me work with it. Maybe I can use it to understand others. No, no one is immune to, to ups and downs in their personalities. And Tishrei, uh, tishrei you have to work on changing your personality. Pesach, you have to work on recognizing who you are and saying, Hashem, what do you want me to do with this? How can I do it in such a way? And you don't want to use Yahadis, you don't want to use religion in a way which is just a cover-up for our own emotions. Because there are people that come down and are just screaming and yelling and angry. You know, women are must never themselves to clean for Pesach. And um, I, I always used to, my father and mother, he always used to have this dialogue. My father would say, you don't have to clean the dust out of the corner. That's not chametz, that's dust. Spiderwebs aren't chametz, you know. And she would take out the Shulchan Aruch and say, look, it says in less than a kazayas. And she would say, it according to you, there would be chametz in this house from top to bottom, you know, if you wouldn't listen. So, so again, there, there's a certain regesh, there's a certain hergesh or Pesach, but you have to come to terms with reality. How does it affect the people around me? Of course, you can't compromise on halacha. But on the other hand, when it comes to the hergeshem, where does it go? In which direction do, do I do it? The Abderav was sure that when it came to chametz, brocking, brocking, no, no, no. There weren't a lot of put matzah into the liquid. It was like, it was, you know, you'd run every matzah to be a thousand miles away from water. And his, his, his old mother was sitting next to him, and they, they had soup, and she had a piece of matzah, and she said, ah, crunch it and put it into the soup. And the Rebbe didn't say a word. It was his mother. It was his mother. And once when his mother was sitting there by the, by the Shabbos table, and she started, she was angry at one of the, I don't know, uh, sh- his daughters-in-law or something, and she started, then he said, Mama, Mama, please, Shabbos, you can't talk. You can't talk Lashon Aaron Shabbos. Can't talk. Right? So w- where did he say, okay, this is Kibbe This is someone's emotions. The Gastonin Rebbe once tied like this. There's a guy came running in. He said, I want to collect the doctor from that Gavir. He has such a constant stinginess. I, I would hear such a story, my heart would melt. And he's such a strong heart. He told him, Slow down. He told him, Don't hate your friend because of your good heart. Don't use your heart to hate your friend because you're so good, you know. So, and, and look what this person is doing. That's not what the Rabbanisha wants. So Ramosha says, I'm married to Gavart. If you learn a Rashi in Pashas Bereshis, so Rashi says, you hear a key. Hashem created the heaven in the first day, but it was liquid. It was liquid heaven. Okay? Liquid heaven. It wasn't in the powder form yet, or whatever. For, fernament, whatever the Taich is there. The second day, Hashem put it into place. How did it say Hashem put it into place? Hashem yelled at it. Right? That's what Rashi says. Hear a key. Chazik or a key. Sha'afu pishaniv rushamayim biyayim erishayim. Daim lachame. It was still moist. It didn't dry yet, you know? But for Karshu Vashani, second day it gelled. And how did it gel? Migaras a Kadish Barhu. Bamra Yhiriki. And Rashi says, Kodam I'm a shtoyman. Somebody walks in, I said, Freeze, what are you doing there? Well, oh, oh, oh. right? Freezes. Shmaim froze. Why did Kosh Brachu do it this way? Why do you have to freeze? Like like Kosh just says, stay in place. Kosh Brachu could have created it that way. So Ramash says a Dover Nair. He says Hashem talks to Shemayim, that refers to the Malachim, right? That are in charge of the sun. The Malach that's in charge of the sun. He does and he doesn't have Bechira. Now, the, the Malach has Bechira. He can make the sun stop. But he's not going to do it. Because he knows if he goes against the Ratzon of Hashem, he ceases to exist. So it's like, uh, do, I, do I have Bechira of jumping into the ocean or jumping off the roof? I do. But if I'm a normal, sane person, I'm not going to do it. Because I know that's the last thing I'll have Bechira on. So the Amish has to say to the Malach, keep the sun going. <laughs> well, I don't, is there a half minute the Malach wouldn't listen? Yeah. Because the Malach is going to bring the sun up. He's going to look down and say... Huzzah, Welt! So much! Look what people are doing on the internet! Look at how people are hurting and stealing and robbing each other! So much pain! So many... To, no! It's a chil Hashem! And then, and then they say there's no Hashem! They're not mocking that Hashem is making the sun glow! No! I, if, I'm going to teach you a thing or two! For the honor of Hashem, the sun is not going to go up! Hashem says, Mind your own business! You shine! Not your, not your job. That's the garu of a Kaddish Baruch that's the Havamina says Ramesha that the Malach wouldn't shine along those ways. You know, Yidin 
and unless we in Hasidic circles, more to speak, where I come from, the word organization or seder isn't so like, uh, it's considered a modern zach. I don't know how to explain this. Uh, and somebody told me when he first came to, Europe, to the Pilot of in Williamsburg, he asked him, what time is Mincha? Modern zach? Time? No, it's time for Mincha. We, we daven, we daven. No, I think it's like, you don't, you don't hang up signs what time we daven. Okay. And it comes to Seder, you know, when the guy says, you know, the guy comes up there, he has a choice. He says, you want the Litvish again or the Chesidish again? He says, what's the Litvish again? He says, 600 degrees. When does it start? Uh, 60 minutes after Shkia. Sometimes he waits 72. Uh-huh. Well, what's the Chesidish again? He goes, 900 degrees. And it starts after this man. He goes, I'll take the Chesidish again. He goes, why? He says, because 900 degrees is not 900 degrees. And when they start, they don't start. You know, like, uh, it's not easy, right? Chedush Erin says, you know, it says that right, the Ebishter went to Esav, you want the title, what does it say? Leisinath, no, we don't want it. He's Leisirtzach, we don't want it, whatever, you know, each one, whatever, whatever the, the respective ones are. So, that, what did Hashem say to the Yidden? How come the, the Yidden didn't say, what does it say in the Torah, and where was the challenge of the Yidden? So he says, yeah, Hashem came to the Yidden and said, you want the Torah? So, what does it say? So, each, 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 each um of Eloshin got something which was hepach their tevet. They would have to break their tevet to be Makayimit. So, the Abisha told the Yidden, the Higbaltoi, you're all going to stand where I tell you to stand. You're going to go, oh, that's so hard. Okay, we'll do it, you know? So, uh, you, you were in the back, you're in the front. Oh, that's not easy. Okay? All right, so you didn't have a Seder. So, like the Welt says, there's one night in the year, there's a Seder. So, we asked Manashtana, like, what's this? Why is there a Seder, right? The Seder is to prioritize, to be Masader in our life what is important. If we understand the value of Shalom Bayez, if we understand the value of children seeing happy parents, even if they're not so happy, if we understand that even though I'm really worried about something and I am not in the mood, and I am so angry about the money that was spent, and I'm going to say, not now, not before Yom Tif. If we understand to reorganize our priorities that is the bracha of Seder. The Kedusha has to come before the Rechitza. But we're not ready for Kedusha yet. We didn't wash yet. No. This is Hashem wants now the Kedusha. Go with the Kedusha. Because your family is sitting here now, they're ready for Kiddush. But I didn't do Urchat. We didn't do Urchat. First you have to Urchat. No, no. If your family is ready for Kiddush, you will prioritize. That is what is important now. Because your kids are watching you. There is that terrible story of the man who had an old father staying by him, and he didn't treat him nice, and they moved him to a brand new house with a big white carpet, and the father was shaking, and he dropped the grape juice all over, and he threw him out. And he knocked on the door, it's so cold, give me a coat, please give me a coat. So he says to the son, go up and get him a coat. So he went up and brought down a half a coat. He says, what's the, why a half a coat? He says, the other half is for you, Ta. When you get old, and you start dropping things. So I told this to someone, he said, I'm shaken from that story. I said, why? How is he allowed to cut the coat on Yom Tif? It's a marshal. It's a malach I don't know why I was like that. You know, your kids are, they're, they're watching who you are. What are your priorities? Do you want to be relegated to a picture, or do you want it to be alive forever after? Do you want it to keep on going? So when the Baba Varov came to the Baron Rothschild, and the ba- before Pesach, for an adove, and the Baron said, I want to show you something. He had this big, beautiful palace, and, uh, you know, machine gun holding guards around it. No one brings chametz over here. Guy came with chametz. They had one of those, you know, things. They wave, you know, check for radiation, you know. No, 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 chametz. You know, they're more sophisticated. They had chametz detectors, you know. It was... So everyone, all the... Wing and eyeing, the Baba Varav said, ah, my father, my Zayda, the sons of Rav, didn't hold to this. What? Your Zayda, the sons of Rav, didn't hold to this? No. Why not? He says, because the avoida on Pesach is to take who you are and to deal with it and do your best to clean it, not to have a separate clean house. That's the Avoid of Pesach. The Avoid of Pesach is we draw the water. So the baron was not very happy, and the administrators who were hoping to make payroll on this check were not very happy. But after a while, he sent, he sent him a lot of money back. Because he told him, I, I, you know, you're real. You're real. The other guys weren't real. You are real. And Hashem sends us messages. A man told me, uh, I heard this story from uh, Michael Rothschild, the head of the Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation, he said a man told him he was going into a business deal in Japan, and the guys that made the order really blew it. They blew it so badly. He was going to walk into this building and lace it to them. And as he was about to walk in, his phone rang, and he got this uh, message from the Chavetz Chaim, this one is the day, Lashon Hara thing. And as he's about to give it to them, so this particular lesson was about Kass and holding yourself back. He said, his phone is beeping, you know? It's not often that a smartphone is smart. And... So he didn't say it. He didn't say it. He said, listen, if that's not Hashgach, I don't know what is. At the end, when they explained themselves, he realized he was totally wrong. They, they did it right. 
And he said later, had he yelled at them, because, you know, and he would have affected their COVID and how things go, they would have lost his whole company and everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Listen. Wait. Kaddish comes before the Urchatz. What? We got to do Urchatz. How dare you go to Kaddish? No, no, no. They just wants Kaddish before Urchatz. Let Kaddish come before Urchatz. So Agav, I was asked by Torah any time to announce. I have no idea what I'm talking about. You sure will explain it later. Uh, that they now have a direct app where uh, as soon as the shear gets downloaded or uploaded, whatever the two, somewhere in the middle, yes. Well, if you're up, it gets uploaded. If you're down, it gets downloaded. And... <laughs> As soon it goes straight to your email. You can go straight to your email. That's if you have an email account. Okay? So if you get, you know, if you hear a story, all of a sudden, beep, 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 you know, and you're about to scream a yell, just understand that there is a hashgacha. Those people are working 24-7. Mama should try to get people to listen, to learn. It's unbelievable. Amazing, serious nefesh. A lot of good Jews out there. So I want to conclude with the following story. Um, the mayor of Pramishlan was the great tzaddik. Great tzaddik, and Ish Kadosh. He was sitting with a Heshel Alisker, and a man came and knocked on the door. And he said, I gotta speak to the Rebbe now, I'm in such trouble, I'm in trouble, I gotta speak to the Rebbe. And the Gabba said, the Rebbe said, no one comes in tonight. It's a matter of life and death, I gotta speak to the Rebbe. No one comes in tonight. And, and inside, the Heshel Alisker sitting with a male person, because this guy's desperate. He says, Tells the Gaba, no one comes in tonight. He's on his hands and knees. Let me into the Rebbe. No one. So the, the Heshla says, I, could you say no to him? He says, can I tell you a story? So the Heshla says, okay. So the Meirul Pamishlana says a story. He says, Meirul is going to tell you a story. He says, there was a man, uh, we'll give him a name, Chaim. And Chaim has a, a big, beautiful mansion someplace up on a mountain, on a resort mountain. And Chaim is in the hotel business. And basically, he has big, airy rooms, and warm in the winter, cold in the, in, in the, you know, warm in the winter, cold in the summer, you lose it after a while, okay? Uh, it's before Pesach. And really, but there's one thing, you know, you opened up the door, he said, cash or credit, or what insurance do you have? And if you didn't, sorry, you're not getting an appointment, you're not coming in. There was no such thing as coming in there without money. And if a guy came knocking, he's freezing to death, and you're the only house in a 50-mile radius, his answer was, there's a Psaju 100 miles away, he takes people in, go to him, ah, this is not a charity place, okay? It's not a poor house, it's not a public shelter. And he was my rich man, just Kittrick and Shemayim. And they were going to test him in such a way that he would lose every last penny that he has. You're, gonna, you're not going to have a single penny to your name. So in the Shemayim, there was an old, old, you know, when you're, when you're being judged, all your mitzvahs, all your averis, and some of you're tossing and turning at night, that's the same when you're being judged. All your mitzvahs, all your averis begin to cook up, you know, there was a whole back and forth, what's going to be with him, what's a design. So they decided, okay, you should have one more test, one more Nesayim. If he passes that Nesayim, we'll spare him, if not, not. So Leoya Navi said, I'm going to go test him. He said, tell you, you'll be too, too gentle. No, not good. Sutton said he's not masking. So the Sutton said, I'll go test him. He said, no, no, you're going to trap him too much. So they made a pshara in Shemayim. They said, the Sutton and the Leo are going to come together. And they're going to work together on this test. Anyway, a guy lays down in the middle of the night. It is freezing outside. He gets under his covers, just at the point where it gets so comfortable. You know, the point where your head starts sinking into the pillow. You hear that music in the background. It's so geschmack. And bring, bring, doorbell. And he says, you know, maybe a cash-paying customer. He gets up, walks downstairs, you know, with a long white nightgown, you know, with the pom-pom hanging from his head, and he's holding the candle, right? You've got, you know, got the picture here. You everything in living color. He takes off the bolts from the huge door, opens it up. There's this old beggar. He goes, what are you doing here? He goes, I'm freezing, freezing to death. Get out! He says, I don't need any food. I don't need anything. So let me lay down in the front, in the hallway. At least spit for the wind. Get out! Slams the door shut. Shh. Walks up, gets back into bed, and just to the point again, where once again his head is sinking into the pillow, and he's so comfortable. Bring, 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 now he's not going to clobber this guy. And he picks up a bat, and he runs down, and the door opens up, and there's the nobleman. Ah, oh, how are you? See, you know, just, I just like I'm waving away all those spider webs. I took this stick. Please come in. And they come in and they're like, he orders the best wine, the best steak. His wife gets up. They're ready. You know, he has the gold American Express card. They have all the gold pirates card, whatever they had in those days. And he sits down and they put it into the special. Those days they had a machine that ran by horse. You know, I don't know how it went. Uh, <laughs> something he put it in. The horse ran with it somewhere. Okay. So they sit down and he's bringing him. And, oh, and, and what happens is little Yiddler comes back. And while well, he's so busy with the pirates, he sneaks in and like cowers, you know, in the corner someplace. And uh, as he's dealing with the pirates from the corner of his eye, he says, "What are you doing here?" He says, "Well, I'm, I'm just laying here. Get out! 
get out. He says, come on, I'm not doing I'm not asking for any food. Just spare me from the cold. Get out. The pirate says, whoa, he's one of you guys. He's a Jew. How come won't you act to the other one this way? He says, I'm sorry, I, I'm a businessman. I don't, I, this is not a charity place. So the pirate says, you know what? I'll pay for him, okay? Whatever I pay for myself, I'll pay for him. Okay, in that case. Ayi, the chaynu b'nei Yisrael, come, ah. Ah, what a schus, ach, nas, as arch, and gefaldik. Because whatever he gives the pirates, he gives him, you know? And he gives him the, the top room, and he wants to have to give him the top room, because whatever he gives the pirates, he wants his bill to be exactly double. And they spend two weeks over there, and after the two weeks, the pirate says he has to leave. Really? I, Rav Yid, where are you going? It's so cold. Stay till next summer. No, he's leaving. And the pirates asks for the bill, and he comes down, he gives him the bill, and the pirate says, what? This is crazy. This is double the amount than what it should have costed. Double the amount. He says, well, you said you're paying for the yid. He goes, it starts laughing. You out of your mind? You think I was serious? That I'm paying for the No way! No way! And the yid starts, you know, his wife calls him, you know, start up with a paris, I'll cut your head off, you'll be in a dungeon the rest of your life, you're stuck, that's it. And he laughs at him, he pays for his half and leaves. The poor yid is trying to sneak out, and he grabs him and says, you miserable wretch! He goes, what do you want from me? I didn't want it. He slaps him and throws him out. And that night, there's the screams, fire, fire, and they both, him and his wife, they, and the children, they jump for their lives. And of course, they were in between insurance policies, and they are completely wiped out. Their building is burnt to a crisp, and they're wandering from place to place, and they're left with absolutely nothing, and now he's threatened, all his businesses are going down the thing. And now, so now he's coming to Mermeo Pramishlana to cry. He says, you want me to let in someone who slapped a Leo Hanavi? You want me to let him in? No. I think in our lives we understand this. Elio doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's Mamish Elio who's coming. There's a pchin of Elio that comes within us. The moral says, the Maranayim says, uh, someone who brings up Surataiv, anyone that brings you good news, has a nitzutz of Elio Yanavi within him. Mm-hmm. There are people in our lives, they're the Elio Yanavi, and there are people in our lives, they're the Satan. And our job is to, is to understand the both, right? The bells are up once went out, the night of Pesach, you heard the Amorit say, Abishashi Ashmatso, Marar Mechutanim Lefanacha. Not mechutanim, munachim lefanachim. Mechutanim are in-laws. So the Belzer Rav said, nah. He said, a marshal, imagine a guy saw a bacher, he was a promising bacher, grabbed him before anyone else grabbed him, he was a poor bacher. He, he even ba- he served half-baked food by the wedding, just get the wedding done. He took away his ripped clothes and he put, it, put on brand new clothes. And after a while, he wasn't so happy with the guy. So he would show him, he would say to him, hey, you know, uh, you had these ripped clothes when you came to me. And the, he was to save a piece of matzah. So you were so anxious to get me, look what you gave, served that night. So he said, that's our relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's the matzah and the marah, mechutanam lefanecha. Shem says, you know, marah, and we say matzah. You see how anxious you were to get us out on time? But that is the equation of life. In the equation of life, we deal with the satan that is within us, and we deal with the kayach of Elio that is within us. And we have to be careful. We have to be careful who we are, because it's that mix that gives us the Nisayim for what Yom Tif is. Um, I, I read this Sefer, came out from Rav now. It's, it's called Eish HaTair, I think it's, it's, I think it's a, a must-read. But one of the stories he has there is that there's a, there's a very, uh, a year who was later, it's extremely hush of a year, and Askin came to apply to Lakewood, and he was very young, he was a young kid. Sir so Byron said, you little kid, you're not ready for Lakewood yet, you know. Even especially the Lakewood at that time with those 14, he's definitely not ready. He's not ready to be number 15. So somebody told Rabbi Aaron, you know who his grandfather is? Who's his grandfather? Rabbi Yaina. Rabbi Yaina. Which Rabbi Yaina? The Rabbi Yaina is Ainakal. Man, Shamus in the shul and the shtibel on whatever, you know, uh, Anche Kartoffel Street or something. Luisa. So he says, okay, a Shamus is a hush of a thing, but why do I have to take his son? He told Rabbi Aaron, let me tell you about the Shamus, he said. He said, this Shamus would invite all the vagabonds to his house every single day and give them breakfast. Every single day. And, because uh, he was the Shamus of the Shul. And the, the Balabatim said, you know, once Shachas was over, locked the door, so he couldn't throw them out into the cold streets, so he took them home for breakfast. Then uh, he began to notice uh, that there was quite a population of different things crawling around in his house. So he started serving breakfast in the thing of the Shul. And one day a guy said to him, oh, you know, his shirt was like, you know, there was, being, there was a whole jungle in his shirt, and he was like so uncomfortable. He said, I can't take it, help me. <laughs> so he, so he, so he, what he did was, he, he walked into an outer room, the shamus, took off his coat, took off his shirt, you know what I mean? And uh, came and said, take my shirt, it's okay. He, he didn't take his shirt in return. He just dropped it in the incinerator. And he walked home like this, you know, without a shirt. Oh, home. Sir Byron said, uh, you're right, I got to take his son. 
There's no way I could say no to a son. A son that grows up in a house like that, I gotta take. This, this, this year is later from the, from the Shalem, from the big Chash of Askonim, Tanid Chachamim today. Let me tell you something. You see that picture? We're in that picture. Either that picture lives forever, in, in light of how we act, this Yom Tev, and what we put into our children, the people around us, or it stays a picture. And that's up to us. When the Panavich Rav once came, he wanted to collect for his library. So he came to a rich man. He said, I'm building a new yeshiva, Panavich in Yisrael. I want to build a big library. He says to him, I don't give money for Jewish libraries. He says, but you're a yid. Your father was, I don't give money. So Panavich Rav was the perfect fundraiser. He says, that picture. That picture. Who's that? That's my grandfather. Amazing. The genes of that person. There's greatness there. Really? I'd love to have that picture in my library. Really? Okay, you can have it. Wow. Yes, that's my grandfather. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay. I, you want to help donate to the library? Yeah, I'll give you a check. He says, Rabbi, so far, what do you have in your library? So the pun of, so far he says, I have a picture. That's all right. <laughs> this is what we have, the picture. Whether that picture lives forever or not depends on what we do the next four days. Cult. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.